Okay, so lab nine. Um, you guys are making it far into the semester. Glad you all are still here. Uh, let me just make sure nobody else is in the waiting room. I think we're okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, all right, welcome to lab nine. Um, so, announcements for this week. Uh, Lab 8 auto graders due on the 20th, so that is this Friday, um, as well as the quiz. Um, and also this lab, Lab 9's handwritten question will also be due on the 20th. Um, then Lab 9, there's a new auto grader portion um, that we haven't had in semesters past. Um, so that will be due the Friday after our week off, so two weeks from this Friday. And that along with a short lab nine quiz. Um, another thing, project four is coming out this Thursday. So be sure to start that as soon as you can. Um, definitely try to kind of just like, yeah, so every, you already know essentially everything you need to know to do project four, especially after tomorrow's lecture. I think that will set you up with everything you need to do. Um, and the nice thing about Pro Project 4 is that there's three parts to it. Um, and you should be, and ideally, I would say you should try and get part A done um, either like Friday or this weekend. I know that's a quick turnaround, but it's, it's, like, it's not that uh, much of a, it's not too much additional work besides what you've already been learning in lecture for part A. So if you try and get that stuff done um, early on, that would be good. Oh, there's somebody in the waiting room. I just wanted to admit them. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, so just, just getting started on Project Four is good. Um, and yeah, it's, it's probably the easiest project. Um, it's conceptually difficult, but certainly not as big of a feat as project three. And I'm sure that many people um, were like, were worrying about how difficult it would be after project three. But you guys are here, so good job making it this far. So lab 10 AG, just a question in the chat. Um, yes, there will be, and it will be due. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, sometimes we have it due like, two days before the final, I think the final's the 11th. So it might be due on the 9th, because um, we don't want you guys to be working on it. I don't know. I remember actually when I took the class that people were working on it right after our final, because it was uh, literally like late, you could use late days for it. Um, lab 10 autograder's not too difficult. There will be a lab 10 autograder. However, um, it's a really good practice for the final, because it's a dynamic programming problem which you guys will learn about uh, maybe this Thursday in lecture, maybe, I think this Thursday in lecture, but, but it might be after break. Um, so it's really good practice for the exam. So once we get to lab 10, uh, I wouldn't be too worried about, uh, it will be due close to the exam, but it's like, it should be part of your studying routine anyway. Um, but yeah, nonetheless, we're almost there. Break is coming up soon. Um, Although I did say like project four is one of the easiest. Um, it's probably a good idea to work on a little bit over break. Um, definitely give yourself a rest at least a couple of days and just chill. Um, but I think like if you can choose to get part A done uh, either before you actually like take, give yourself a break or after that and then just kind of like get a little bit of an understanding for what you need to do for part B that's a good place to be when you come back from break. And then that last week or so, once you get back from break, should be enough time to do either like finish out anything with part B and finish out part C. And that'll keep you in a healthy position. Um, anyway, that's just quick announcements. Um, something else we like to cover at this point, uh, this is pretty chill lab today. Like there's not a ton of stuff to cover. Um, except for some of the stuff that you guys have been covering in lecture. Um, will we be able to submit to Autogator during the break? Yes, you will. And I think some staff might actually be holding office hours as well. Um, 
I don't really, I'm not a fan of that idea just because I think everyone needs like a break and everybody should kind of be pushing themselves to give themselves a rest, especially this semester. Um, however, if you are feeling good and you just are good to keep working, then yeah, I think there will even be some office hours. Um, and of course, yeah, AutoGrader will be open. Um, sorry, I have to manage the chat box so it doesn't block to the middle of the screen. Um, so yeah, anyway, this at this point in the lab, we like to talk about future classes. Um, just because uh, it's about registration time. And if any of you are capable of registering for upper levels, it is useful to hear someone's information. Um, now, I can't speak to a ton of these courses, but uh, currently I'm taking East 482. So if you've taken 370 and now you're in three, 281, um, you can take 482 uh, whenever, once you have those two courses. And it's a difficult class, definitely a very high workload, but it's one of the best classes, I think, um, here. And I'm surprised it's not a requirement just because most CS programs require operating systems knowledge. But what you learn in this class is definitely very important to just becoming a better program. Oops, sorry, becoming a better programmer overall. So I highly recommend it. Um, beyond that, I definitely encourage you to look at all the course descriptions for these uh, classes, uh, look into the professors, uh, talk to, you make posts on Piazza about it, talk to your peers, talk to other IAs. Um, it's good to try and plan out what you want to take going forward. Um, and there's a lot of great classes here. So if you're curious to learn more about these, definitely ask around, read about it, um, and all that. Uh, additionally, uh, if you can't register for any upper levels, uh, either if you're not planning to, or if you just are, you get on the wait list for a bunch of them, I wouldn't be too worried about that. Um, definitely take 370 and 376 if you haven't already. Um, especially if you don't have any upper levels that you'll be taking. Um, take, getting 376 out of the way is a good idea. Um, I actually really enjoy 376. Um, a lot of people kind of dread it, but surprisingly, 376, I thought was a lot better than 203. And I, I really hated 203. So if you, even if you feel like, when I went in 376, I had very low expectations. I thought it was gonna be very bad, but ended up being a really interesting course. So if you commit your effort to it and you're like, uh, uh, I don't know, pay attention and lecture and follow along and go to office hours and commit to the homeworks, uh, you can get a lot out of the course. And I think it really makes you uh, think about theoretical computer science in a really nice and interesting way. And at least in my opinion, I thought it was a lot more like applicable than um, 203. So it was just more gratifying experience. Um, so don't be afraid of 376 and don't put it off if you have room to take it uh, sooner. Because I know a lot of people do put it off. Um, so yeah, any questions about future courses or anything like that? Otherwise, we'll get into the, the rest of the lab. Yeah, feel free to unmute or put in the chat whenever. Um, but it seems like we're good, so I will keep going. Um, so today, the, on the agenda, um, we're going to go over graphs, um, MSTs, um, and the two MST algorithms. All of this should have been covered in lecture, um, so it'll mainly just be uh, reviewing it and then briefly discuss the handwritten problem for this week. Um, if you're curious about the last week's handwritten problem, we're not going to discuss it in lab, but you can find it in a slide in a slide set that's on Canvas under the Lab 8 folder. There should be one that has the handwritten problem solutions for it from last week. Um, one more thing I wanted to note about the auto grader assignment associated with this lab is that there are many solutions to it. Um, so don't, if you feel like you're not sure of your solution, just go with it. Um, you'll need to be doing some sort of searching. Um, but it's good, for, it's that honestly, this, this week's lab is also really good practice for the, for the exam. And I wish they had it when I took the class. So, um, but yeah, nonetheless, there are multiple solutions. So, um, just, yeah, keep that in mind whenever you decide to start it. All right. 
Uh, yeah, I don't know who added this in, but I noticed these in the someone someone added this into the slide set. So I keep to get in. Um, but this is the emoji of the week. I don't know. Have they been doing this? If they've been doing this in previous labs, uh, in past weeks, um, but yeah, that's cool. But we shall continue. So let's talk about graphs. Uh, I lost the chat box. Okay, yeah. I just I know that like the stuff on my screen will block. The stuff on your screen, I don't want to mess with the two that. Okay, so um, graph terminology and ADTs. So the general definition of a graph that we'll talk about, as we'll think of it in this class, is just a set of vertices and edges that connect them. So uh, it's pretty straightforward. We kind of briefly saw this in lab four when we were doing connected components things, because that really has to do with graphs. Um, the formal definition is that it, a graph G is the set of V and E, where V and E are the sets of vertices and the set of edges, where each edge is a tuple or a pair of vertices. That's the very formal definition, and that's something that if you take 376, you'll see a lot of. Um, in general, there are three different types of graphs. Uh, directed graphs implies that there is direction to each connection, which means it either goes one way uh, or the other, or it's bi-directional. Um, an undirected graph, you could either see them as having no direction or they're just all bi-directional. It's arbitrary and they, just a connection is just a connection. Um, and then a weighted graph, uh, you will see that each connection has a weight. So, and that weight can be described as cost, capacity, um, distance, all these different examples. Um, and when you get, when you start working on project four, you'll be dealing with a, an undirected weighted graph in a sense. Um, so yeah, it's a terminology that should have been covered in lecture as well, but um, a simple path is just when you have a sequence of edges from one vertex to another um, and there's no vertex appearing more than once. Um, connected graph is when you start at any vertex and you can get, and a connected graph, that means you can get to any other vertex in the graph. So it doesn't mean that it's fully connected. A fully connected graph would mean there's an edge between every, vert, every pair of vertices. Um, however, just a plain connected graph is when there's just a path, a simple path between any two vertices. Um, a cycle is when, yeah, there's a simple path with, between a vertex and itself. Um, and then dense and sparse. Um, dense is when the total number of edges is very close to the maximum number of edges. And then sparse is when there's not nearly as many edges. So something I wanted to ask you guys just for some engagement was, um, and you should have, this should be from lecture, but just to kind of reassert, um, what are the maximum number of edges in a graph, like in terms of vertices? Yeah, V squared, exactly. So, yeah, because that's just the case where there's a vert there, there's an edge between every vertex, every pair of vertices. So the maximum number of edges is V squared. Very good. Um, so second question would be for a connected graph, what is the minimum number of ed edges in terms of vertices? And recall that a connected graph is when there you can get from one vertex to any other vertex. Exactly, yeah, V minus one. And that makes up an MST, which we'll get into shortly. Um, well, yeah, usually, yeah, an MST. Now, there could be, a sparse graph could have even less than V minus one edges, just that for it to be connected, it has to have at least V minus one edges, and that's as small as it can be. 
And typically that would be considered sparse anyway. Um, so yeah, cost, additionally, we briefly mentioned it during, um, while discussing the definition of a weighted graph, but cost you can say is either the cost of each individual edge, like, or if you're talking about the overall path, you'd say the cost of the path is the sum of all of the individual costs of each edge weight. Um, so if you guys remember from 280, project two, when you had to calculate the cost of kind of through the image processing, um, this is a similar way where if we're thinking about graphs, we wanna find what's the cost to get from this point to the next versus, yeah, maybe that could have been a graph. I don't know, I haven't thought about that in depth. I kind of just thought about it just now, but like the 280 project two, you could have seen it as sort of like you were trying to traverse like the, from one edge of the image, end of the image to the other, and you had to find like the minimum uh, cost to get there, which you did. And it's kind of similar to like a graph problem that you'll be encountering in project four. So, oh yeah, another thing, undirected graphs or unweighted graph, you can assume the cost is one. Um, so yeah, we have different data structures to represent uh, graphs. First off, we have an adjacency list, which is essentially a vector of linked lists. And each index in the vector would be a vertice or vertex. And within that is the set of vertices that are connected to that vertex. So, a, and there are different ways to kind of make this adjacency list. You could make it to where each, uh, node in the length list is just a connected vertex or you could make it to where each node in the vert in the in the length list is a pair and that pair could be the connected vertex and also the weight from the weight of that connection from this uh from the index vertex to that vertex in the length list um, Additionally, we have an adjacency matrix. And now in the adjacency matrix, you can think of that as a 2D vector. And in that 2D vector, when you double index into it, um, each of those two indices will represent a, together will be a pair of vertices. And in this, at least in this picture right here, if it's implying that it's an uh, unweighted graph, so if it's a one, that means that they're connected. If it's a zero, that means they're not connected. If it were a weighted graph, then each of those cells would contain uh, different uh, integers than one and zero because they would represent weights um, for each edge. Any questions so far on general graph definitions and simple uh, data structure representations before we move on to uh, some search algorithms? Yes, the matrix will always be symmetric. Yeah, because you should be able to index into it from with the pair on either side, and it will be the same. Yes. In an indirect graph. Ah, yes, that's something good to point out, Paige. Yeah, Un in an undirected graph. Yeah, that's good. I, I've not, I don't think I thought of that. Um, but yeah, because yeah, I don't know if we ever will have an example of that. And you may be in an exam question. That's good to think about though. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, if, it is an under, if it is a directed graph, then an adjacency matrix would have different weights um, at when, even when the, if the indices are flipped. Because if it's only directed in, in one way, then the weight would be put in that side. So if it was like one to two and the direction was from one to two, then the indexing in at one, two would have the weight versus indexing in at two, one would probably be zero. Um, I don't know if that was covered in lecture or not, um, but yeah, and I don't know if, that's definitely something good to post on Piazza as well and see if professors respond because I'm not sure if we've uh, clarified that for the overall class, um, but thanks for pointing that out, yeah. In a directed graph, it might be different, but in an undirected graph, you can assume symmetry. Okay. Um, so, oh yeah, sparse percent graphs. I forgot. Um, so, 
This is just a little quick um, questions for you guys. So a tree, would you guys say that a tree is sparse or dense? You got one for sparse, two for sparse. Yeah, three for sparse, yeah. It is sparse because recall, like we had mentioned earlier, the maximum number of edges for a graph is V squared. So um, that's kind of a general, and so the denser it is, the closer it will be to that. Um, one thing about a tree, since it is connected, um, and typically, and, it, and I think it is minimally connected, not necessarily an MST always, but um, at least this graph is minimally connected. Uh, so this, the number of uh, edges here, I think is V minus one. I haven't counted, but typically if it's closer to V minus one, it's gonna be sparse. If it's closer to uh, V squared, it'll be dense. So yes, it is in fact sparse. Now the internet, and this one is kind of unintuitive. Um, so think twice, but would you guys say it's sparse or dense? Sparse, okay. Sparse, two for sparse, three for sparse. Yeah, nice. Okay, it is sparse. Um, a lot of, I, t I taught lab earlier today, a lot of people were saying dense, but um, I definitely thought it was dense when I took the class initially, but it is sparse. And it is the point of this is kind of to emphasize that we're talking about the number of edges. So when you think about hyperlinks on each, on any given web page, it's very unlikely that there will be hyperlinks to every single possible web page in the internet at any given web page. Um, so the number of edges, especially when they're defined as hyperlinks, um, is not going to be anywhere. It's not going to be very close at all to v squared, the maximum number of edges. So it's being sparse is good, and the purpose of this is to show that we're focused on number of edges. Now. It's so the last one with uh, dictionaries. So an edge is defined here as a, yes, yeah, so there's an edge if two words, between two words, if they start with the same letter. So what would you guys say for this, sparse or dense? Dense, got one for dense. Another for dense-ish, okay. That's a good answer, I like that answer. Okay, so right now the consensus is kind of dense, but it is, at least how we defined it, yes, it is dense. So the reason it is dense, and I like dense-ish, um, is, and it's hard, this is really an in-between-ish one. Um, so would you have, exactly, you would have 26 different clusters. So for each letter, all of the vertices there will be fully connected. It's like all of the A's will be fully connected. However, there are no connections between the clusters. So the graph itself, it's not connected because you just have 26 different components. Um, however, calling this sparse versus dense is hard to say because while each cluster is fully connected, they're also completely disconnected from all other clusters. So there's a very large amount of, and I mean, I, you could calculate this in some way, like the, well, I mean, yeah, if you really wanted to, like look at the dictionary and figure out how many connections are actually missing. So it is pretty far from V squared. Um, however, each cluster is very dense. I mean, each cluster is as dense as it can be. Um, the overall graph is not as dense, um, but, and it could kind of go either way, but 
in general, we'll call it dense um, for this case. Um, one thing to note is that if you get asked a sparse versus dense question on an exam, it typically won't be like this where we give you some arbitrary scenario. It'll pretty be, it'll be pretty straightforward and and more obvious um, than any of these examples. Uh, and usually it'll be put in the context of uh, is, is prims or cross goals better on a sparse or dense graph or something like that, which you guys have learned. And we'll also go over that again in this lab. So that's sparse and dense. Um, thank you all for participating. So graph traversal algorithms. Um, so we've got two main ways of searching through graphs, a depth first search and a breadth first search. Uh, a depth first search typically uses a stack and a breadth first search typically uses a queue. However, a depth first search can also, besides using a stack, could also be recursive, similar to many tree algorithms or tree traversals that you're used to. Um, so like you can iterate, or no, sorry, not iterate, you can recurse all the way down to a leaf node and algorithms like that are, or resemble the style of a depth first search. Um, the main difference is that using, I mean, I think taking the context of a stack versus queue is a good way of putting it because essentially the pseudocode for a depth first search um, is the same as a, sorry, the pseudocode for a breadth first search using a queue. Um, if you change that queue to a stack, then it becomes a depth first search, um, which is nice. And I'll, we'll, we'll go over pseudocode uh, in a minute. But the, the, although you can't do a breadth first search recursively, I don't think. Yeah, you can't. Because if you recurse from the child, then you just make it a depth first search. Um, okay. and another thing to note about breadth first search is that it is the same as a level order traversal or a level order search. Um, and that's something to keep in mind. Uh, I know that can be a little bit confusing at times, and I don't know if it's ever explicitly stated in lecture, but essentially a level order traversal is the same as a breadth first search. Um, but yeah, so and yeah, there are some other notes on here um, with finding the shortest path. Uh, BFS can find the shortest path between nodes when it's an unweighted graph or when they all have the same cost. Um, and the reason for that is because it's iterating through, um, in a level order traversal. So it's going to be hitting it in a different way than a depth for search where you're iterating all the way to the bottom. Um, but yeah. Okay. Uh, and you'll, you'll see more of how breadth first search is used when we get to Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, that's briefly discussed. I don't know if, I don't I think it might have briefly been mentioned in the lecture by now, but we'll discuss it a little bit more in detail in a few lectures. And that's kind of related to breadth first search in terms of discovering and so in terms of finding shortest paths. Okay. So here's some quick pseudocode. Um, this is a recursive version of a depth first search. And it's essentially doing what we were describing where it's uh, instead of using a stack, it's going to be going to each child and then performing a depth first search on the child. And then it will, so that'll be a recursive step and it'll eventually return from there um, with whatever result. Um, now, more important pseudocode, I would say, is breadth first search. Um, and also, this, yeah, these labs are, these slides are posted on Canvas, so definitely uh, go back and write down the pseudocode at some point. Um, it's very useful for um, the Lab 9 autograder assignment as well as potentially the exam. Uh, nonetheless, yeah, we have a breadth first search where we use a queue and we're simply adding the children to the queue. And so in that way, we'll be going through a level order traversal um, with a breadth first search because we're taking by adding all the children of a particular node into a queue, we're gonna be visiting all those children before, before visiting those children's children. So we'll be taking it level by level. 
And then as I was talking about a little bit earlier, if we change this queue to a stack and we add all the children to a stack, then as we start popping off, whenever we start to remove things from the stack, um, that will lead us to be doing a depth first search um, because we'll be adding the surrounding children and then going into one and then and as we keep adding to the stack as we traverse into one child we'll once we add all of that uh child's children we'll be going down each level um, and doing a depth first search um, any general questions on uh, BFS and DFS. All right, cool. So yeah, if you have any, put them in the chat, you can unmute, and then I can come back to those two if you have a question later on. All right, so yeah, that covers breadth first search and depth first search. Um, and now we'll get into MSTs. So move this stuff out of the way. Moves over here. Sorry. So a spanning tree is just a subset of a graph that contains all the vertices, it's connected, and it's acyclic. So however, this doesn't say anything about the total cost or the sum of all the weights of those edges, at least in regards to a, um, a weighted graph. So all what we do is that, and the key thing is that there's no cycles, not all the vertices are included. Now, sorry, this. Now, yeah, and this is pretty much the key definition for a minimum spanning tree, where a minimum spanning tree, then we start taking into account the weights of each edge that's included in the tree. So it still has to be connected, acyclic, um, and by connected, we're essentially meaning that it contains all the vertices. Um, and each of those, and the sum of all the edge weights, or the cost in total, is going to be uh, smaller than the sum of any other spanning tree. So we're finding the optimally minimal spanning tree. So just taking this as an example, we have a simple graph. Um, and while this is a spanning tree, the, sums, the sum of the edges is less than this spanning tree. Um, so this is definitely not an MST. And this one just happens to be an MST because this would be the uh, minimum sum that we could get out of a connected acyclic subgraph of our overarching graph. Any quick questions on general MST principles before we get into prims and cross schools? All right. So, prims algorithm. Prims algorithm and cross schools algorithm are both greedy approaches to finding an MST in a graph. And what Prim's algorithm does is you have two groups, innies and outies, where innies are vertices that are in your current MST that you're building, and outies are vertices that are not in it that you will be adding to the innies. And ultimately, you will be adding every single vertex to the MST. Um, the main thing is what you're doing is you're trying to figure out what's the connection you want the outie to have with the innies. And you're going to solve that greedily. Um, by looking at, um, for each any, seeing what, for each any, after you add it in, you'll update adjacent vertices that it's connected with. Um, and as you continue, as you pick an Audi to add, you're going to pick the Audi that is closest to your current MST. And eventually you will have your MST, your total MST. Um, and then an important thing to know for Prim's algorithm is that it is best for dense graphs. Kruskal's algorithm, which we'll get to later, is best for sparse graphs. 
Oops. So yeah, just quick little, this is imagine this is mid uh, Prim's algorithm. We have four selected vertices so far, and then all of these in pink <clears throat> are in the Audis. And so what we do is we think, okay, we're currently in this at this point, and let's say we're starting a new iteration of our Prim's algorithm overall loop. So the first thing we want to do is find the closest Audi. So that's the closest out vertex um, that it's the out vertex that has the smallest edge weight to one of the any vertices. So just by simple looking at it, we can see that this one is going to be it. Um, so what we'll start is we'll say now this vertex is now going to be part of the innies. Um, and now that it's part of the innies, it's possible the outies that are connected to this new any, um, their distance from the any group should be updated because it's now they're connected to an any vertex. So the next step is then to update those. And for example, this Audi was not connected before or was not, um, didn't have a distance before, but now it's connected to an any, so it has a new distance. And this Audi already had a distance because it was connected to a different any, but now we should be updating the distance since a new adjacent, a new vertex that it's adjacent with was added to the innies. So because of that, its distance may or may not be changed if it's smaller. Now in this case, it is smaller. So we would change that distance uh, to account for that. Um, and then we would just repeat this step all over again and say, now we wanna add the next closest Audi. Um, and as we do that, we'll eventually build up uh, to a full MST for the graph. Um, don't worry if that was like a little quick and confusing. I think it's easier to, like we'll get to this and I think it'll be easier to kind of show the full algorithm. Um, that was kind of just a general overview of what each step is. And now this is the pseudocode, very similar to what we, you guys saw in lecture. It's an O of V squared uh, linear algorithm. Um, and this is what you'll want to use in, in project four, part A. So you're very closely be um, implementing uh, this sort of description of what you should be doing. And that's just like general information you guys should know going into project four um, when it's released. And yeah. So, what you do is like I was describing, you describe, you just pick a, you start the overall um, algorithm by choosing a random any, and that's outside of the loop part. And so from there, then you'll do your iteration between um, all of the loops, or sorry, all of the vertices. And you will start off by choosing the Audi that is closest um, to your current any, and then you will add that Audi as an any, and then update the uh, connected Audis to that new any. Um, a lot of Audi any talk, so maybe that's a little weird sounding, sounding but um, that is essentially what Prims is all about. Um, this is very similar to what you guys were talking about, what you guys saw in lecture. So just a more detailed example, again, very similar to lecture, but um, we start off, we've already done our first step by choosing an arbitrary Audi vertex or Audi vertex to be an any. And in this case, we're just choosing the first vertex in our, uh, in our, in our data structure, which is completely valid arbitrary choice. And well, the distance will be zero for this one because it is not in, uh, because it is, it is connected to itself essentially. And we've chosen it to be an Audi or sorry, chosen it to be an any. Um, and it doesn't have a parent either because it was the first uh, vertex added. So now what we'll do is we'll say, okay, now which Audis are connected to our chosen any? So in this case, it's V2 and V4, and we'll update their distances and the parent uh, relative to uh, V1. So once we save that, because now we've added V1, uh, what we'd want to do is then say, which one of these two, we'll iterate through the Audis, all their distances, so all the ones that are false, iterate through their distances and say, which is the minimum one? 
in this case it's v4 and so now we'll say okay v4 is the vertex that we'll add to our mst our current mst that we're building so now we repeat the process we added v4 and now v4 is connected to v3 v6 and v5 and we'll go ahead and those are the three Audis it's connected to. So we'll iterate over those Audis and we'll set and we'll update their distances to an any vertex. So that's what we do here in red and all their parents change as well. So now we'll do the same thing. We'll have these four false vertices, the four Audis. We'll iterate over them again and say, which one has the smallest distance? And now it's gonna be V6. So we add V6. Except this time V6 is not connected to any other vertices that are Audis. Connected to V4, but V4 is an any. So there's nothing to update in this step for V6. So we'll do the same thing. We'll iterate over the Audis and we'll say which one should we add, which uh, vertex should we add. So here we add V5 because V5 had the distance four, which is minimal. And now for V5, V5 is still connected to an Audi, it's connected to V2, and it, its distance to V2 is shorter than what the old distance was, which was 13, when V2 was connected to V1. So in the update step, we'll, V2 is still an Audi, so we, it is a candidate to, be up, to have its distance updated. So after V5 is added to the MST that we're building, V2 is updated. And then finally, um, we're only left with, so we choose the next uh, smallest distance, which is V2 um, at five. And then we're finally left with V3 uh, as the only left Audi, so we add it and its distance is six. So this is what constructs our MST. And with the algorithm over, we have our final complete MST. Any questions about that? Um, anything I can clarify or repeat if needed for the, um, the general algorithm and prims in general. Okay. Um, all right. Don't see any questions, so keep going. Um, in terms of complexity, the, the implementation and algorithm that we just discussed uh, for prims was the linear version. So the complexity of that is O of V squared. Uh, there are two other possibilities, one of which was I know was definitely talked about in lecture, which is I think the I don't think the Fibonacci one was talked about too. I'm not sure, but the binary heap version has a slightly better complexity. Um, However, with dense graphs, it's not that big of a difference. Um, additionally, the, actually with dense graph, it's actually worse, I think, because your E is gonna be V squared. Um, so yeah, you have a binary heap version, which although it's a better complexity, it's not always optimal, or it's not always better. Um, and then the Fibonacci heap version, similarly, better complexity, um, however, again, if it's very, if it's a very dense graph, it's not going to be as, uh, as good. Um, you don't need to really worry about these two. Um, it's nice. It's useful to know what's discussed in lecture. However, beyond that, you won't need to be implementing them or anything crazy like that, because they're, although the general algorithm is, holds true, um, it's still going to be that greedy approach. Just the implementation details. Uh, get a little funky. And I think, yeah, if you, or if you saw that part in lecture, at least it's definitely much weirder than the linear approach. Um, so once you get to project four, uh, after it's released, uh, make sure you stick to the linear method. Um, and that's what we, we try to make that the implication in the spec, I hope. Um, so yeah, that's the general complexity for prims. And we can go ahead and move on to cross goals. If you have any questions, just put them in the chat. Um, so Kruskal's algorithm, again, it's another greedy algorithm. Uh, this time it's 
better to use cross codes when you know you have a sparse graph. Um, and instead of adding, uh, having, like, I guess, maintaining two sets or a general table and tracking innies and outies, um, instead we're just going to be directly choosing edges to add to our MST. And this is what's called building a forest. Um, and we will iteratively select the cheapest edge um, so that we're slowly adding, uh, so we're slowly building up our MST because ultimately the MST is just made out of edges. Um, and then it's important to note that you will need to do a cycle check to make sure that the edge you're adding does not form a cycle because a cycle is not allowed in the MST. Um, and yeah, once you, eventually all the vertices will be part of the same set because as you're choosing edges, it's not guaranteed that all the vertices will be, or all the vertices that are involved in the, in the, in the partial MST will be connected. However, by the end of it, they should all be connected. So quick example, similar to what we had before, but slightly different edges. Um, imagine we're just gonna go through a quick round of cross goals. We'll, we'll add each edge in order um, from smallest to greatest, unless we can't add the edge. So we add two, we'll add four, six, or no, five, and then six. Um, so that's all good so far. Now we, we want to add seven because that's the next smallest edge. However, we can't because it would create a cycle. So then we move on and add 13. Now at this point, we know all of the vertices are in the MST and they're all part of the same set. So we can end our algorithm there and we have our MST. So yeah, Crosscoils is nice in that um, it's a, I, don't know, I think it's uh, nicer to walk through. However, it is, the implementation is a little bit more complicated. So with the complexity of it, what you do want to do at the start of cross goals is you want to sort the edges by their weight because otherwise the, that's, as you're iterating through and adding, um, adding edges to your MST, it's not going to be as, um, it's not going to be as fast as it would be when you just sort it up front. The reason being that you'd have to search, do like a full on search uh, throughout the container every time to find the next shortest, um, the next shortest edge. However, sorting it ahead of time saves on that quite a bit. Um, the next step is really just do union find, which is what um, you all worked on during lab four with connected components. Um, and the key to that, the key reason behind that is that we're essentially building disjoint sets from, by picking, vertice, uh, by picking edges. Um, and so we know that as we pick an edge, we ultimately wanna have all the separate components to be connected and each vertex should have the same ultimate representative. So we'll be doing a similar union find algorithm as we continue. Um, so, uh, additionally, yeah, the overall complexity is going to be O of E log E uh, or O of E log V. Uh, it depends. Uh, either is valid because in the worst case, E is going to be V squared. And um, when E is V squared because of log rules, um, that log E becomes log V as is shown in the math down here. Um, and then, yeah, so in general, cross goals is faster on very sparse graphs, as is noted. And you want not to be implementing cross goals in this class, um, but it's an interesting algorithm and it is talked about a lot. I talked about a bit for a couple lectures in 376. So if you're taking that anytime soon, you will see cross goals again. So that covers prims and cross goals. Any questions about those two algorithms? I think I could go back and clarify or Anything else? Otherwise, yeah, we'll get into general modifying an MST and how changing edges will impact your MST. All right, so looks good. We'll continue. Um, so we got four cases here with modifying an MST.
And essentially we have where we're, chain, we're altering the weight of an edge that is in the MST or we're altering the weight of an edge that is not in the MST. And there are different effects that these have on the MST. And this part will be a little more interactive. Um, so imagine we have this MST and we want to change that green edge from eight to three. So we're decreasing the weight of an edge that is inside of the MST. How would that change our MST, if at all? None, yeah, that's good. Don't think it changes, yeah. Change. Um, essentially, the, the edge inside of the MST, the MST is already minimal. So if you're decreasing one of the edges, it's just gonna be even more minimal. So there's not gonna be any new edges that we'd wanna add in or any edges that we'd wanna take out of the MST when we're decreasing the weight of an edge inside of the MST. So yeah, good job. Um, then now we'll say, what about an edge that's in the MST and we're gonna, uh, oh yeah, never mind. this is the, okay, yeah. Okay, so let's say now let's consider an edge outside of the MST. So what happens if we changed this green edge from nine to one? So we're decreasing the weight of an edge that's not in the MST. What would we need to do here? Hmm. Sorry. Eight. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so you would want to remove the eight um, and replace it with the one. Uh, it's exactly what you want to do. So we had, since an edge changed outside of the MST, that means there's a possibility that our MST should be altered. So in that case, um, we would want to replace um, eight with one because of those edges, of these edges that were connected, so of the edges that, of the edge that was changed and the adjacent edges, um, we have two options. We, I mean, we do want to, now we know that since it decreased, we are going to want to replace one of the edges it's connected with. Um, so in order to choose that, um, we need to create a cycle and at least this is one method we want to create a cycle and then remove um, the edge with the highest weight so and you would do that as it's described here using a simple uh, graph traversal either a depth first search or breadth first search because in reality although this is only three it could be a much larger cycle that's created by adding an edge um, so that's how you'd go about removing um, this edge, or, or choosing eight as to be the one that's removed. Okay, so we just saw that when you decrease the weight of an edge that's not in the MST, then that could lead to, you will need to check the MST and see if you should remove an edge or replace an edge. So now we have the option where we're increasing the weight of an edge that's not in the MST. So what would we do here? If we made that five into seven and note that five is not in the MST, that edge. Yeah, 
Nothing. Exactly. Similar to our first example, um, we don't need to change anything because it's already not in the MST. So if it's not in the MST and it's increasing, it's still not going to be in the MST. So there's nothing to change here. Oops. Yeah, nothing to be changed. Um, okay, now our final example, let's say an edge that is inside of the MST is increased in weight. So we make this eight into 11. Now, what would we want to do here? Or how would this change? Yes. Pick up the edges with nine. Yeah, exactly. Exactly what we would do. So we'd want to replace eight since it became 11. So that means that the MST is no longer an actual MST because there are edges that connect these two components, the two black components that 11 connects that are smaller. So we want to look at, there are two methods for this one. This is the one with two methods where we want to see which of the other edges that connect these components um, is going to be the minimal one that will yield our new MST. Now in this case, they're all nine, so we could pick any of them. But if they were different, we would want to pick the one that is the minimal one, that is the lowest weight that connects these two components. And then we would then add that edge um, back to our MST. Um, and then we would also, we could look at, yeah, so in this method, we can look through the, in this method, yeah, we can do, um, use again, a BFS or a DFS uh, to quickly look up all of the individual edges. Um, I think you can also use like a union find in a similar way um, with the edge. Uh, Nonetheless, this is what you would, you would essentially follow something like this to replace the edge that was increased in weight. And then this essentially takes us to the end of the lab. So we had these four scenarios, just quickly summarize, um, where scenarios one and two, or sorry, scenarios one and three, uh, we didn't need to change anything because if we decrease the edge uh, inside of the MST. So if it's even smaller, then it's gonna be an even more minimal MST. So there's nothing that needs to be changed because we're just making it you have an even, even lower cost already. If we're changing an edge from the outside the from outside of the MST that is and we're increasing it, then that means we again don't need to change anything because the edge wasn't in the MST to begin with. So if we increase its weight, then nothing is gonna to need to change because it still won't be in the MST. And then two and four, these two are ones where it will lead to a change in our MST. In two, we were decreasing the weight of an external edge. And when we do that, that means that edge, it's possible it should replace a different edge in the MST. And with that one, we want to use that cycle method to find an edge to evict in a way. In the fourth option, when we're increasing the weight of an edge that is inside of an MST, we want to look for among all of the other edges that connect the two components that this edge was connecting, we want to pick the minimal of those other edges to replace the one that we just increased. So that covers these four scenarios. Any questions on these before we wrap up with the handwritten problem? Any questions in general too? Crims, cross goals, MST stuff, graph stuff, 
BFS, DFS, anything. All right, seems all good. Um, handwritten problem for this week is you're implementing this and there will be more details in the Canvas uh, handout. But essentially, you have an undirected graph, and you want to check and see if there's a cycle in it. Um, so you're going to be given an, an adjacency list. And this adjacency, this adjacency list, uh, I believe this graph is also unweighted, because the adjacency list does not have a weight component to it. Um, yeah, double check the whatever we have on Canvas to assure that. And so all you need to do is just create an algorithm to determine whether or not this graph that's represented by the adjacency list has a cycle on it. So if it has, if it has any cycle on it, then you know you return true, otherwise return false. And that is the handwritten problem. And that also wrap, wraps up lab. So Unless you guys got any questions in general, that is all I have to talk about with y'all today. So thanks for being here. If you got any questions, let me know. And then I'll end the recording as well, in case you guys don't wanna, if you guys would rather speak without the recording going, so. That wraps up this lab nine.